Welcome to the third session of AP Daily Live Review for the 2022 AP Physics 2 exam. Once again, my name is Other Strotterman, and I teach AP Physics at Lawrence Free State High School, home of the Firebirds in Lawrence, Kansas. I'm also honored to be the co-chair of the AP Physics 2 Test Development Committee. It is my honor to be presenting to all you amazing AP Physics students from all over the world who are going to do amazing on the AP Physics 2 exam on Friday, May 13th. Let's get started. We're going to start with an overview like we've done in the past of the eight AP Daily Live Review sessions that me and my good friend, Mr. Mancino from Connecticut are going to be doing. And then we'll look at the agenda for this session. Monday and Tuesday, we did the first two units in Physics 2, Fluids and Thermodynamics. Today, we'll do Unit 3, Electrostatics. Mr. Mancino will cover the next four sessions over circuits, magnetism, optics, and modern physics before I wrap up next Thursday with a session over exam format and test strategies and tips. As I said in the last sessions, uh, the general content organization of all my videos this year will be the same as far as the, the physics part. Um, however, I will not be reteaching the content as I did last year. This year I will instead be very briefly reviewing the concepts and equations and then discussing and going over several questions from previous AP Physics exams. If you need a refresher on the content, I did that every single session last um, year and those videos are available on YouTube and they're also available in AP Classroom under review. So let's get started with the foundation of this unit, which is charge. Last year in AP Physics 1, the gravity force was the main driver. The gravity force is created by the property of matter called gravitational mass. And gravitational mass, matter, um, its property of gravitational mass, feels this gravitational force. Charge is a property of, of matter as well that is a result of there being an excess of electrons or fewer electrons than protons. This creates an electric force if you have an, another object that has a charge or an object that can be polarized that can feel a, um, a force from an electrically charged object. The major difference is that matter is always gravitationally attracted to other matter, while objects with charge can be attracted or repelled by other objects with charge. A super common multiple choice question you're going to see when we look at an electric charge is about fundamental charge. Charge is oftentimes symbolized with a Q and has the units Coulomb, but an important thing to remember is that there's a fundamental amount of charge. And that multiple choice question you probably would see is you would be given several possible charges that an object has and be asked which is possible. They will be very small amounts of charge. You notice that the fundamental charge of an electron is 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19th coulombs, a very, very small amount. They're going to give you a very small amount of charge and ask you which is the multiple of that number. So maybe they'll give you 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19th or 3.2 times 10 to the negative 19th or 4.8 times 10 to the negative 19th coulombs, those sorts of things. You'll also notice that a lot of times uh, they're not going to give you an amount of charge in coulombs because it's such a large amount of charge. Look how many electrons or protons is. That's a lot of electrons and protons to be excess on an object. So a lot of times they'll give it to you in nanocoulombs or microcoulombs. Now, if you can't remember nanocoulombs or microcoulombs, check out the table of information to see those prefixes. Now, one of the things that uh, we try to do in AP Physics is we try to use physics words right. And one of the words that gets misused a lot of time is the word charge. Folks will use the word charge to talk about an object. I'm going to do my best throughout this video to call objects that have charge, charged objects, not charges. This would be like if you call an object a mass or a weight. That's a super common thing to do, but we don't like to call an object by a property of it. We would never call an object a volume. Look at that volume over there. Or go get a box of volumes from the cabinet. Although we do sometimes say go get a box of masses or you're going to use a weight to perform this experiment. We would never really say you're going to use a volume to perform this experiment. So I'm going to try to do my best to talk about charged objects versus charges. 
Now, another thing that we're going to want to make sure that we talk about is different types of materials and what charge, specifically electrons, can do in that material. We can have conductors. Conductors are materials that allow electrons to freely move from one part of an object to another part. An important thing to know in AP Physics 2 is a lot of times we may say metal and it be synonymous with conductor. Similarly, an insulator is a material that does not allow electrons to move freely. Now, in real life, there's gradations of this. In AP Physics 2, it's, a, it's pretty much a one or the other. It's a conductor where electrons are loosey-goosey and free to move however they want to, or conductors where there's zero movement of charge. It, we're going to use things like rubber or plastic or wood as a synonym for an insulator, something that a charge cannot move freely in. And the last thing we need to make sure that we remember about charge is different ways that we can give an object charge. Three main ways we'll talk about. One is friction, where we rub the two objects together. Conduction is when we touch one object with another object, and one of the objects has charge and transfers charge to it. That oftentimes happens between two conductors. Or another way we can do that is we can induce a charge. And this is something that I went into a lot of detail in the previous video from last year. I would really go and check it out. Now, speaking of friction, one of the things I like to give you guys sometimes in these videos is little, little bits of trivia that you don't need enough for physics to, but I think are super interesting. And one of them is something called the triboelectric series. This is an interesting series, an interesting uh, list of materials that you can use if you rub two materials together. Which one is losing electrons, which is gaining electrons? And there's a really great uh, Wikipedia site that you can go look at, just Wikipedia triboelectric series, and you're going to get a lot of great information about this sort of charging. And there's a, there's a picture on that page that shows a cat not having a good day. When you go look at it, I promise you that uh, you're going to know what I'm talking about. Once again, this is not something you didn't know for the exam, but I always like to give you a little bit of trivia being the uh, scholarship ball coach at my high school. When we talk about charge moving around, we really need to make sure that we remember about conservation laws. Conservation laws mean that whatever you, the amount that you start with is the amount that you end with, as long as the system doesn't allow anything to leave it. Yeah, we could have that be um, mass. We talked about that with um, the continuity equation. It could be about energy. We talked about the Bernoulli's equation. We could also be about conservation of charge. Now, there's lots of different types of quantities that can be conserved, and one of them is charge. This is something that's going to be important when we talk about uh, charging objects. We transfer charge. Another thing that's going to be important is next uh, session, Mr. Mancino will talk about this um, when he discusses Kirchhoff's junction rule when we're talking about circuits. Let's start off with a couple multiple choice questions from previous AP Physics 2 exams. Now, I'm going to try my best to, to remind you, but one of the things that I would encourage you to do is take a second to just look at the question, maybe pause the video, and then we'll talk about the answer. So in this situation, there are three identical conducting spheres, sphere 1, 2, and 3, and they're supported by insulating thread, as shown above. Initially, sphere 1 has a net positive charge, and the other two spheres are uncharged. Spheres one and two are brought into contact and then separated. Next spheres two, three and two, uh, two and three, I should say, are brought into contact and then separated. Which of the following shows the signs of the final net charges in the sphere? So we've got these conducting, probably metal spheres hanging from insulating strings. That means that the, the charge can't go up through the string and out into the world. And so if I touch a positive sphere with a positive with a non-positive sphere, then this these two spheres are going to share that charge. Now, what's physically happening here is positive charge going from sphere one to sphere two. No, sphere one has fewer electrons than protons. And so electrons from sphere two will go into sphere one, not make it neutral charged, but will cut that amount of uh, electron deficit, as it were, in half. And so sphere two will become positively charged as well. Now, if you separate them, sphere two is still positively charged. And when it touches sphere three, it's going to split that charge with sphere three as well. You know, an interesting follow-up question for this would be, so oh, just <laughs> let's make sure we get the answer real quick. I'm thinking it's choice A. Now, an interesting follow-up question to this would be, what will be the charges on the three spheres? Will it be a third, a third, a third? Hmm. 
Are they splendid equally or will it be something different? Well, let's think about it. When I first touch those first two spheres, they're going to take that positive one amount of charge and split half. So you'll have positive half and positive a half. And then when you uh, touch that sphere two to sphere three, what's going to happen? Well, that positive half is going to get split into two. So you're going to have positive a quarter and positive a quarter, which you'll notice is still a positive one charge. Okay, let's look at one more multiple choice question about charging. And pause the video if you, if you need to look at the question and think about it for a second. A student has a positively charged insulating rod and two initially uncharged conducting spheres A and B with insulated handles. Which of the following ordered sequences of actions could the student use to produce a net positive charge on sphere A? For a question like this, um, I really like to draw a couple pictures, maybe the beginning picture and the ending picture, or in this case, just kind of draw a picture to help me visualize it. So I'm gonna draw a couple um, spheres. I've got sphere A and I've got sphere B. And those two things are touching and maybe we should possibly touching. So I'm gonna put them closer to one another. So why is the rod insulating the positively charged rod? Well, if I'm holding a positively charged rod and it's conducting, that charge is just going to flow into my hand or charge for me is going to flow into it. In this case, since it's positively charged and has a uh, uh, lack of electrons. So that's the reason it's um, insulating is that charge can't move around. It's just kind of stuck on the rod. So what can we do to make that... Um, a net positive charge on sphere A if I have a positively charged rod. Well, if I put a that positively charged rod near sphere B, it's going to attract electrons from A and B towards B and leave a, uh, a net positive charge on A. So let's see if there's an option that says that. I, I already looked ahead a little bit. Let's look at C. Bring the rod near the right side of B touch A to the left side of B, remove B, and then the wand. It's really important that you remove B and then remove the wand. Because if you remove the wand, if you remove that rod, I should say, not wand. <laughs> I'm thinking magic here for a second. If you remove that rod, then uh, it's going to go back to neutral. A and B will go back to neutral. So you have to get move that A away from B in order to keep that charge. OK, there are. Let's move it on from charge. It's the foundation of this whole unit of electrostatics. In this unit of electrostatics, with charge as my, as my foundation, as our foundation, there are four electrostatic quantities that arise from objects having charge and objects with charge interacting with other objects with charge. And these four electrostatic quantities are electric field, electric force, electric potential, and electric potential energy. Now, I've got these four quantities in a specific um, arrangement. And the reason I have them in a specific arrangement is because electric field and electric force are related to one another. Electric potential and electric potential energy are related to one another. But also electric field and electric potential are related to one another as well as electric force and electric potential energy. Let's talk about those uh, relationships. Let's first off talk about the relationships between electric field and electric force. If I have a charged object, it creates an electric field around it. If I put another charged object near that first charged object that's creating an electric field, it's going to feel an electric force. So if I point at a point in space where there's a charged object near it, there will be an electric field. If I put another charged object there, it will feel a force. That's how electric field and electric force are related to one another. Electric field is, uh, electric force, I should say, is measured in Newtons, and electric field is measured in Newtons per amount of charge that I put there. Electric potential, electric potential energy is similar as well. If I have a charged object, I can point at a point in space and say that point in space has an electric potential. Electric potential tells me if I were to put another charge there, how much energy would it take in order to make that um, configuration of charged objects? Electric potential energy is measured in joules, just like all energies. And electric potential is measured in joules per amount of charge that I put there. 
how are electric field and electric potential related? Well, I like to put those next to one another because there is an object that's, that's charged that's creating a field around it. And there's a field and a potential at a point in space. If I were to put another uh, charged object there, then it would feel a force and there would be an electric potential energy between the charges. Let's start with the most kind of straightforward of the four electrostatic quantities, and that's electric force. And electric force is governed by something called Coulomb's law. Electric force is equal to, I like a lot of times just to say K, Q1, Q2 over R squared. The, the way you see it in the, uh, on the screen now is the way it's on the AP Physics 2 equation sheet. And that one over four pi epsilon naught is equivalent to K, which is the Coulomb's law constant, nine times 10 to the ninth. I like to use that, it's a lot more straightforward. What we're gonna be doing in AP Physics 2 doesn't ever require one over four pi epsilon naught. The F sub E stands for electric force. The Q1 and Q2 stand for the charges of the two objects. And R is the distance between the center of the objects that are charged. Look at how similar this equation is to Newton's law of universal gravity. The force of gravity is related to the product of two masses. It's inversely related to the square of the distance between. And it also has a constant to make things work out. This equation is super similar to the uh, a gravitational force equation. The main difference, of course, is that the electric force can be attractive or repulsive, and the gravitational force is always attractive. Let's look at a uh, free response question from a previous AP Physics 2 exam dealing with Coulomb's law. Once again, take a second to pause real quick and look at this question. The figure above represents four objects. We're going to be looking at this question many times throughout the rest of this video, with charges shown as, as above. They are held in place at the corners of a square. How? We don't need to worry about that. Point P is at the center of the square, distance D from each of the objects, which is going to become useful later on. Express all algebraic answers to the following in terms of big Q, D, and physical constants. What could possibly be a physical constant? Lowercase k, Coulomb's law constant. On the dot below, draw an arrow that represents the direction of the net electric force exerted on the object with charge positive Q by the other three objects. Notice that this is not, 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 not asking you to draw a traditional free body diagram for the object with a charge of positive Q, but rather to draw a single arrow that represents the net force acting on the object with a charge of positive Q. The number one rule, number one rule of all AP exams is to very, very carefully read every word of the question. Don't just assume something from the diagram. I would look at this and say, oh, I bet they're going to ask me to draw a free body diagram. I'm going to start drawing lots of different electric forces, and I'm not going to get credit for this problem. Now, what's happening with that positive Q in the top right-hand corner? Well, you'll notice that that, um, that the uh, positive 2q and the positive 2q are going to be pushing up with large amounts of force in these two directions. And the negative 2q is going to be pulling it this direction, but with not as much uh, force. It's not going to have as much force. And so because of that, you're going to have a net force up and to the right. Now, do you need to worry about it being at 45 degrees? Do you need to worry about it being at 45 degrees? You do not. And the reason you do not need to worry about it being at 45 degrees is that because you don't have a protractor for the AP Physics 2 exam. So really what we're looking for is there, is it just pointing up and to the right into quadrant one? You can, however, use a ruler or a straight edge, which is something that I would really encourage you to have. So we started with the most basic of the four electrostatic quantities, electric force. But before we get to the other three electrostatic quantities, let's review a little bit about some gravitational quantities to help us perhaps get more familiar with the other three electrostatic quantities. I think if we think about the other three electrostatic quantities in terms of the gravitational analogs, then they are easy to understand. So let's look at the four gravitational quantities Three, uh, three of which you probably learned about in AP Physics 1, but one of them you probably did not. 
So we know the gravitational force that's measured in Newtons. That's a force an object that has mass, all objects have mass, feels that's in the gravitational field. Now, it's important that the, the mass of the object, the gravitational mass of the object is what's interacting with that gravitational field measured in Newtons. Gravitational field strength, that lowercase g, that's that magic 9.8 number or 10 that we used over and over again last year in physics one. We used a little bit in uh, the last couple of units as well. That's if I were to put an object at some particular point in space, how much force would it feel per kilogram of stuff that I put there? For us here on Earth right now, we're all feeling about 9.8 newtons of force for every kilogram of stuff that we put there. Gravitational potential energy it talks about how much work I need in order to move something in a gravitational field, how much work that I need to do in order to, to do that. And this is the energy of a system of objects measured in joules. Now, gravitational potential, this is the one we did not talk about probably last year. That's if I were to put an object at a particular point in space, how much energy would that system have? Not how much gravitational potential energy does the system have, is if I were to put an object at a particular point in space, how much gravitational potential energy would the system have? Joules of energy per kilogram that I put at a particular point in space. Let's look at a couple different examples real quick. I realize this is something I did in the last video, but it's so, so important to think about these gravitational analogs as we look at these different electrostatic quantities. Now, I've got this one kilogram object at a couple different points in space, one meter above the ground, two meters above the ground, assuming here on Earth. If I talk about how much gravitational force that one kilogram is feeling, it is 10 newtons of gravitational force, so 9.8 newtons, we'll round it to 10, I like to do that, at both points in space, because it's a uniform gravitational field. Also, the gravitational field strength is about 10 newtons per kilogram of stuff that I put at a particular point in space. Now, what, hap what about the gravitational potential energy? What about the gravitational potential at one meter? Well, I know that the UG is 10 joules. That's my MGH. What about my gravitational potential, not potential energy, potential? That would be 10 joules per kilogram of stuff that I put there. Now, how is that any different for the other position? Well, the other position, I'm going to also still have 10 newtons of force. I'm also going to have a gravitational field strength of 10 newtons per kilogram. But now, since it's higher, my gravitational potential energy and gravitational potential are also higher. Now, my UG is 20 joules, I should say, and my gravitational potential is 20 joules per kilogram. It just happens to be that I have one kilogram of stuff. Now, if I think about all these quantities, my Fg is Mg. My Ug, I already said, was Mgh. Well, what's my gravitational potential? Well, it's how much energy per uh, amount of stuff, amount of uh, matter, amount of mass. That's going to be Gh because Gravitational potential is energy per mass, energy per kilogram. Let's start off with the first of the three other electrostatic quantities, and that's electric field. Electric field, you remember, is if I were to put an object that has a charge near another object that has a charge, how much uh, force would that charged object feel per kilogram that I put there? So if I have a charged object, there can be a point in space that if I were to put an object there, how much uh, force would that feel per amount of charge? An important thing about electric field is that I'm always pretending that I'm putting a positive charge there. If I were to put a positive charge there, how much force would it feel per charge that I put there? Let's practice with a couple of different other um, AP Physics 2 for response questions from previous exams. For this first question, it's that same diagram we looked at before. It says calculate the magnitude of the electric field at point Q due to all four objects. 
On the dot below, draw an arrow to indicate the direction of the net field at point P. Electric field, you remember, is the direction and how much force a positively charged object would feel if you placed it at a particular location. Now, for the diagram, they are once again asking for the net force, not a free body diagram. How am I going to figure out how much, uh, what the electric field is there as far as direction goes? I'm going to pretend I put a positive test charge at point P. What direction would it be pushed? So I got to think about all the directions that it's pushed. Well, what's nice is that at point P, you'll notice that it's going to get um, it's going to get pushed by the positive Q this way. It's going to get pulled by the negative Q also that away, and it's going to get pushed either direction by that positive two Qs on either side, pushing that test charge away from it. And so my answer is going to be down and to the left. That's the direction of the net force. Now, it doesn't tell me to label it, but I'm probably gonna wanna make sure that I maybe label it with an E just to make sure that they know what I'm talking about. Now, for the electric field, to calculate it, you need to find the vector sum. Electric field is a vector, not a scalar. We're gonna look at some scalar quantities in a bit. So direction matters. This sort of question can be a doozy normally, but you'll notice there are two things that they have done here to help. One is that the positive two Q objects cancel and they give us the, and also they give us the distance from the corners versus the length of the sides of the square. So it's not a ton of uh, geometric or trigonometric calculations you need to do. And fortunately, the positive Q and the negative two Q are um, pulling and pushing in the same direction. So I'm just going to need to kind of um, add them together as it were. So let's look at the rubric. Once again, I got that uh, arrow down to the left. I got a point for that. And I'm going to add the individual fields, which is 2kq over d squared and kq over d squared. That's the direction down into the left. And I add them together and I get 3kq over d squared. This is perhaps the most abstract in my mind of the four electrostatic quantities, especially since this is not one we talked about its gravitational analog last year, probably. However, this is the electrostatic quantity that is going to be the star of the show next unit when you are talking about an electric potential difference, moving charge, and voila, you have electric current. And that's what Mr. Mancino is going to talk about more tomorrow. Reminder, electric potential is how much energy would a charge have per coulomb if I put it at a point in space where there's an electric field. This is in contrast to electric field, a scalar quantity, just like energy is. It's not a vector quantity. Vector quantities have directions like northeast, southwest, or you know, things like that. But scalar quantities can also be positive and negative. But don't make that, don't, that doesn't necessarily mean, not necessarily, <laughs> it does not mean, <laughs> not necessarily, it does not mean, period, that it has a direction. Positive or negative means something else. And this is the reason that I think this gravitational analog and talking about a gravitational analogy is super duper useful when thinking about electric potential. So we're going to look at a couple of different slides that I go into much more detail last year talking about electric potential. And I think electric potential is really a great analog and analogy is elevation. Now, if I think about a topographical map, let's say this is a topographical map that I've shown you here. Um, that is uh, that I've got by um, having a hill and a hole. Now, a couple of different things I'll point out to you is you'll notice that there are positive elevations. There's positive elevations around the hole, negative elevations around um, the, sorry, not the hole, <laughs> positive elevations around the hill and negative elevations around the hole. Positive elevation hill, negative elevation hole. Now, the other thing you'll notice is that there's different amounts of steepness as well. That right here, for example, it's very steep, but over here, for example, not as steep. Now, this is something that we're gonna be using and thinking about when we talk about electric potential. And also we can go back and talk about that with electric field. Now, how am I using this analogy? A positive charge is going to be a hill and a negative charge is going to be a hole. And electric field is going to be steepness. And that electric potential is going to be elevation. 
So let's think about that for a second. I'll go back to that picture real quick. Now, if I look at this picture again, and I think about the hill and the hole, if I were to put a ball, let's say if I put the ball right here, midway between the hill and the hole, what elevation is it going to be at? It's going to be at an elevation of zero. That means that if this was a positively charged object and a negatively charged object, its potential in the middle would be zero. What about elevation? That's potential. What about steepness? That's electric field. If I were to put a ball, a positively charged test uh, charge halfway in between, it's going to get pulled into that hole, rolled down away from the hill. It's a good way of thinking about electric field for steepness. Steepness also has a direction in this case, and electric potential, which is elevation. This is a really great thing to think about when we're doing problems. Let's look at this idea of hills and holes and elevation and steepness and use it to think about an electric potential problem. So remember, this is the same diagram we used to determine the electric field. Let's think back to that question for just a second. If the objects have positive charge, the ones that have positive charge were hills, and the object with negative charge was a hole, what direction would a ball roll if you placed it at point P? So think about that for a second. Now, you remember, we said the electric field was down and to the left, didn't we, right? I'm not sure that <laughs> the electric field is down and left. I always get mixed up if the camera's me around or not. Well, if this is a hill, and this is a hill, and this is a hole, and this is another hill, what direction is a ball going to roll that I put there? Well, it's going to roll down into the hole away from the two hills, which is the direction electric field. What about for this electric potential question? Let's think about elevation at point P. If I've got three big hills next to it and a pretty sized, pretty big sized hole near it, would it have a positive elevation or a negative elevation? Well, in this case, we're talking about having a positive elevation. Now, how do I add up things in order to get the electric potential? Remember that it's a scalar quantity. And so I just use that uh, KQ over D and I have positive KQ over D for positive charges, positive elevation, and negative KQ over D for negative elevation. So super nice that they give me the distance to the middle. That makes the problem a whole heck of a lot easier to, um, to work. Let's look at another example. I'm gonna give you a second to pause to look at this one. Now, when I look at this picture, this is a picture like a topographical map. And I can either have had two holes here or two hills. Because if it was a hill and a hole, I'd have a point of zero elevation or zero potential in between. So I must have two hills or two holes here. Well, what kind of charge does it say one of them is? It says, um, and Y is positive. That must mean both of these things have positive charges. Otherwise, like I said, you have a line of, of uh, zero elevation in between. It says, indicate the values of the potentials, including the signs at the label points A and B. Well, A and B, you'll notice, are next to that positive Y. And it says that, um, does it give me any of the values? It says the Value of the outermost is 50 volts. Volts is joules per coulomb. That's the elevation, remember. And the lines, how far apart are the lines? It says the lines are 10 volts apart. So 60 volts, 70, 80 volts. So I'm going to put 60 volts here and 80 volts. I'm going to put a plus sign next to them, talking about there being positive elevation. Excellent. Yeah, I got that right. <laughs> Just making sure real quick. So this next question talks about how do the magnitudes and the signs of the charges of the spheres compare, compare? Explain your answer in terms of the ISO lines of electric potential shown. Now, what is important to notice is that not all of the equipotential lines are shown around the charged object at point Y. They just give it the same number of uh, equipotential lines, elevation lines, as it were, around Y as there are around X. And so they just leave them out. There should be more concentric circles, more um, equipotential lines around Y, showing increasing potential resulting, in a lar resulting from a larger charge. So which one has a larger charge? I'm saying Y does. 
And reminder, I know that also that that you know they have a positive charge. Um, they're, they're the same charge because there should be a uh, there would be a zero um, equipotential line, a vertical you know line like this, if they had opposite charges. The spheres at point X and Y have masses in the same ratio as the magnitudes of their charges. The ISO lines of gravitational potential for the spheres have shapes similar to those of the ISO lines shown. Explain why the two sets of ISO lines have sh similar shapes. Well, if I have uh, these uh, two objects and I think about them being hills and holes, well, these are going to be two hills and their relationship would be the same. Another thing to say is that Coulomb's law looks a lot like the Newton's law of universal gravitation. And now for the last of the four electrostatic quantities. This is the one that we know the gravitational analog pretty well from last year in physics one. And that is electric potential energy. Electric potential energy is similar to gravitational potential energy. And if you remember from last year, gravitational potential energy is MGH. Now you remember GH is gravitational potential. So UE is charge, left like mass, times electric potential. But I could also write a difference in UE as equal to QED, a lot like my G and my H up here for MGH. Let's practice with a couple different, uh, actually, we're just gonna probably look at one example, example real quick for electric potential energy. This is an example of a, um, uh, a, a question that has you write a paragraph length response. So take a second to look at this real quick. In a coherent paragraph length response, briefly describe the meaning of electric potential energy and explain qualitatively how electric potential energy can be related to work. That's important. They don't want you to calculate anything. Also explain qualitatively how the electric potential energy of the four object system would change if the positive Q and positive two Q objects on the right side of the square now switch positions. Support your explanation using appropriate physics principles. Now, they've given you a list of things. Make sure you do all of those things. Describe the meaning of electric potential energy. Well, electric potential energy is talking about if I have more than one charge and I put them near one another, the amount of work necessary to move them near one another is my electric potential energy. How can it be related to work? Like I just said, however much work I need to do is how much electric potential energy is in the system. So for example, when I moved this positive Q near the positive two Q, I need to push, 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 and do work. With all of these four, the total energy of the system is the total amount of work necessary to move them all into the positions. Now, what about when I switched the positive two Q and the positive Q? Well, you'll notice that now the positive two Q is closer to the other positive two Q that would be harder to do to move that positive 2Q charge near another positive 2Q charge versus just moving a positive 1Q charge near it. So it would require more work. I bet there's going to be more positive work necessary. So in an increase in electric potential energy, let's see if we're right. For indicating that electric potential energy is the energy stored in configuration of charge objects, check. For indicating that the change in electric potential is equal to the work done, check. And for indicating that moving the object positive two results in an increase in energy, and indicating that the positive Q results in a decrease, but the positive two is a bigger increase. So that last point be before the paragraph length response point is for indicating that the net result is an increase in the energy. Now, one more thing we need to talk about are is the electric uh, field between two charged parallel plates. We call this a capacitor. Mr. 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 Mancino will be talking more about capacitors next video when he goes over electric circuits. But for now, we're going to look at how the space between two charged plates and near the middle of those plates in particular can create a uniform electric field. 
This is like the constant gravitational field we are experiencing right now, no matter if you're on the second floor or the first floor, or maybe you're on the 10th floor of a apartment building, no matter where you are in the world, it's right around 10 newtons of force per kilogram of stuff. So if I have two charged parallel plates, it's similar to that. Now, electric field between charged plates, it depends on a couple different things. It depends on the area of the plates. It also depends on the charge. This vacuum permittivity will be something your, your teacher is going to go into more detail about, I'm sure. I mean, if you need a quick review of that, that's good. that would take a lot of time to talk about. Um, but it's an important thing to, to know that uh, the, the more charge, the stronger the electric field. But the more that that charge is spread out, the weaker the electric field. Another thing to make sure that we remember about is the electric field is uh, proportional to the potential difference between the plates, as well as the how far the plates are apart from one another. Let's look at a quick example. And we're only going to look at um, uh, part uh, A for now before we wrap up real quick. So take a second, pause the video. And you know, if you want to go back and look at the answers to parts B and C, you're more than welcome to. Just Google AP Physics 2 2015 for response questions, and you can go back and look up those questions and look up the answers. Which of the plates, top or bottom, is negatively charged? Support your answers with a reference to the direction of the electric field between the plates. If you look at the picture, the dots represent electrons coming from this electron source. First off, make sure that you talk about which plate is negative. That's what the question asks for. Also notice it says to discuss the direction of the electric field. Make sure you do that as well. You have electrons that are being accelerated downwards. They're getting pushed downwards. They're moving downwards because of the, the electric field between the two plates. Electrons are pushed opposite, in the opposite direction of the electric field. Now remember, the electric field tells you the direction that a positively charged object would be pushed. So since they're pushed down, the E field must be up, which would make the top plate negative and the bottom plate positive, which would mean that a proton, for example, would get pushed up by the bottom positive plate and attracted towards the top negative plate. So what should we take away from this video? When we looked at different electric charge terms and quantities, we talked about methods of charging and conservation of charge. Then we talked about the four electrostatic quantities, electric force, electric field, electric potential energy, and electric potential. And we talked a lot about some gravitational analogs of those quantities as well. And we just wrapped up with just a quick look at uniform electric fields resulting from charged parallel plates. Mr. Mancino will be back tomorrow. I'm going to take a little bit of a break with the next video over Unit 4 electric circuits. Like I said, I'll be back next Thursday for the last video of the AP Daily Live Review uh, for the 2022 AP Physics 2 exam. And I'm going to be talking about the format of the AP Physics 2 exam, as well as strategies to use during the exam. And if you're watching this video via YouTube, please make sure to subscribe to this channel to not miss out on any other review videos for AP Physics 2, as well as any other AP exams you may be taking as well. Thank you so much for joining me. Hopefully I made your review of AP Physics 2 a little more fluid.